with uh, the poems that I have Xeroxed in the little packet that you have. I'm going to make a few remarks beforehand, read a tiny bit of uh, academic prose that I wrote um, to justify this proceeding, and then move swiftly to the poem and poems and the uh, extraordinary enjoyment of reading them together. I, um, I was thinking that it is autumn and um, that we're going to die and that we're also being asked to sense as the season changes the difference between one set of ideas and another and another in a political election in which we're exhausted with thinking, second-guessing, def defining. We are approaching a full moon. Um, some of our parents are ill. Some of our parents have already died. Some of us have fallen in love. Um, George Bush today, or yesterday, said that he uh, had stopped drinking in 1986 um, because of a higher calling. Um, some of us have the sensation of the ineffable, um, present every now and then between events in our daily life. And usually we have separate opportunities for doing each of these things. We get to be parents and children and lovers and teachers and we get to have intimations of immortality or mortality. We tend to look up at a tree in autumn and feel suddenly something unexplainable, and then we cross the street. Um, we have these things very much compartmentalized, and not just on different channels of our television, but also in different channels of our sensibility. And we so most certainly have um, thinking and feeling um, pretty much organized as separate events in order to survive uh, our daily lives. If we were to feel everything that we saw just walking down the street in any American city, it would kill us. So we tend to find a way around some of those feelings in order to survive, and we call some of that going around um, thinking. Of course, there are many different kinds of thinking. And uh, one of the functions of poetry is to do everything that I've been describing in a way at once, to break down the sense that one can't be in all those parts of one's sensibility at once. And that at-onceness of one's um, being in the world is a very complicated experience, but one in which um, both the poet and the reader engage in a successful lyric poem. Um, but often when we are confronted with those poems, whether in a classroom or even later in life on our own, we tend to feel that one strain of our sensibility um, is asked to organize the material called the poem in front of us and interpret it, um, come to terms with it. We look for the story in it or the narrative. We look for its we're taught to look for its interpretable meaning. We think of it as a kind of secondary gloss. Um, and we are certainly terrified by the feeling that we're not getting the poem and that there's something happening in the poem and that's eluding us. And so we tend to feel frustrated. One of the reasons is perhaps that we're bringing reading habits that we have acquired engaging other linguistic activities like fiction, or journalism or theater, we're bringing those reading habits and that relationship to what one does in the act of reading to a poem. And unless the poem happens to be a narrative poem, often those reading habits are not quite useful to us. And because they become frustrated, that frustration is um, going to be with us all evening. Um, that frustration is the sensation we have of 
the bafflement that poetry is supposed to occasion. Now, there's a difference between the kind of baffling that I was talking about to begin with. Um, it could all be garbage. <laughs> that would be fine with me. Um, there's a difference between the kind of baffling, which is uh, from the Zen Buddhist point of view, an experience of yugen, a sensation of the ineffable, something that um, breaks down one's capacity to reconcile this with that on separate tracks and compels one in a way to, to engage in what Eliot would have called the use of a undissociated sensibility, what he felt that quintessentially British metaphysical poetry was capable of, writing out of a unified sense of self in which thinking and feeling are not so separated out to generalize and make just two broad categories. Um, but sometimes the baffling that we experience in reading poems is closer to a sense that we're not using the right part of our own sensibility as readers to approach the poem and that we're perhaps coming at it with a different set of tools than the person who wrote the poem. And so we kind of think, well, maybe if I knew what the poet had in mind or what the poet intended, I could go there and do that. But as the poem stands before me, I don't know what to do. We tend to go to poetry readings if the poets are living, hope that their voice will make clear to us sometimes what the poems mean. And it is my feeling that um, we're often not doing a very simple kind of work um, that I call reading um, below the threshold of interpretation, something very close to what Keats would call negative capability. And he adds, without irritable reaching after fact and meaning. Um, it has been the project of much poetry since Romanticism, in particular modernist poetry, in many instances, to precisely baffle one's desire for irritable reaching after fact and meaning, and to compel the reader to read with other aspects of his or her sensibility. That's one of the major projects of the wasteland in order to awaken, as Eliot would say, to bury the head that it may sprout again in spring so that one has to read with one's ear or read with one's senses or read with, you know, suspending one's desires in that poem, for example, to know who's speaking, where they're located, what they're saying in terms of narrative progression. Um, but you're very familiar with this in visual art and very ready to accept a certain kind of bafflement um, because um, the pleasures of a certain kind of um, what we call abstraction um, have, are very physical and material and palpable when you confront a um, painting. Sometimes they're less clear in a linguistic act because it seems to mimic a regular linguistic act and therefore you feel like the approachability of it is being unfairly occluded by its methods. And so um, I'm going to read a page of the essay that I wrote that concerns this to sort of explain perhaps um, to teachers who might end up looking at this videotape uh, what the cornerstones of this thinking might be. And then I'm going to look at poems that um, are involved with uh, autumn, aging, the journey that we're on, all of us, the sense of losing something and gaining something as you age, and we're going to try to read them together. This little somewhat overwritten essay begins this way. Why do we read, why do we make poems? Why do we read poems? What do we mean by read? What are we asked to do when we undertake the act of reading a poem? How does such a reading differ from other kinds of reading? What is such reading meant to do to us and for us? Obviously, such questions demand a far more complex analysis than a short examination. This thing goes on for 20 pages, such as this one allows. But perhaps a brief enactment of what goes into and comes out of the act of reading is in order at this point. It does not seem to me to be, for example, an act best viewed as the result of, or even the recreator of, a social construction of self, a psychological construction of personality, 
or even the result of an inherited or historically imprinted aesthetic temperament. I don't think it actually in any way involves or even shapes taste or aesthetic or moral or political inclination. It is involved with a, with a constant cultural redefinition, refiguring, even perhaps reliving, of what we feel to be the act of representation. It affects, and the very act of reading adheres to, notions like whether there is, for example, death in representation. But the poetic act, and I would argue this is as this as readily for writing as for reading, is the result of and the supreme recuperative action regarding the crisis of what might, we might call, for want of subtler terms, subjectivity. A crisis which is born out of the continually re-engaged longing for and fear of objectivity and its perpetually attempted reconstruction out of a vast arsenal of strategies that utilize and engage subjective stances and subjective means. A crisis and a set of recuperative responses to that crisis that keep the life of life in life. Iconic activities involved in a particular economy of interaction between interiority and exteriority that keep the sensation of meaning alive and most importantly connected to the sensation of being. A great deal of high thinking of our day revolves around this crisis and profound distrust of subjectivity. And yet it is as if by crossing through subjectivity, which is really, in other words, what the poet has in mind in their poem, as we usually intend it, subjectivity as we usually intend it, untrustworthy, socially constructed, personal, the subjectivity that regarding language renders our utterances partial, shaded by a deep, unavoidable arbitrariness, by going beneath what I would call psychological subjectivity, personality, as Eliot would have it when he says we have to go through personality in order to transcend personality, to a sensorial or bodily subjectivity, one could, by bottoming out past the deeply solitary psychological subjectivity, I feel this, you feel that kind of thing, arrive at the profoundly communal physical subjectivity. I would even say physiological subjectivity in the poems I'm going to look at tonight. I shall try to enact such a process in this talk to demonstrate how such a subjective point actually represents a radically trustworthy level of objectivity. Not only objective because universal and shared at a physical, perhaps even at a physiological level, but because by such means it is communal and communitarian. It interests me how such a shared experience throws us back to the original tribal function of poetry and into a vocabulary that evokes its role as an iconic as opposed to representational force. And it is this use of so-called personal lyric activity to not only reach but potentially create a communal sensation of reality. I presume by the end of this that you and I will be feeling the same way about many things that interests me and how the participatory nature of all steps along this arc, from the personal lyric to the communal song, constitutes not only a profound understanding of poetry's function in our culture, but to my mind, a description of one of its dominant functions throughout history. What I propose to do is examine what we are asked to do by poems in the act of reading them, etc paragraph about that, and then the last little bit that I'll end on, the radical difference, let's just see if I should read this part here. I, I propose to look at how description and the retrieval of it via reading and a partic via particular actions of sensibility and mind we are asked to engage in as readers restore to that verbal world such profound objectivity both in its function and its nature. I am interested in how such reading, uh, reincarnates us who are so easily disembodied, or to put it more bluntly, reduced to interpretation. How it rescues us from constructed contingent sites of being, and more on that stuff. Um, I'll end on this one sentence. The radical differences between reading and interpretation as we commonly understand and undertake those actions is the core of my concern. Now I'd just like to look at the poems and take a look at what we're talking about here.
This is sort of like a method acting class. I'm going to try to move through stages um, of reading together. Um, you're free to disagree. Just um, let me try to get my, uh, my reading across and then disagree. I ask you to try to feel what parts of your body and of your, which of your senses you're being asked to employ by the writer of the following lines. In the very top of my wonderfully handwritten little handout. Very swift point I'd like to make here. Two quick sensations for us to track together. Sniff of green leaves and dry leaves. It's a line of Whitman's. It's theoretically a smell. Um, I actually have no idea, maybe you do, what green leaves I'm being asked to smell. The, high acrid smell of pine, the uh, delta foliage, um, the sweet smell of eucalyptus. No idea what the green is. And nor do I know what kind of dry. An equivalent problem exists there. What I do is I resolve it conceptually. I feel that there's an opposition. I immediately move the line up into my head. And I think opposition, green, green dry, alive, dead. Um, deciduous, evergreen, whatever. I have to plug in something. Even the poet tells me to do the work sniff because he hasn't done the work. Um, as a result, because it's general, it's vague, the conceptual intellect, you, you, if you feel it, you feel that you receive that line completely in your brain. There's nothing else you can do except sort of imagine that there's an opposition here and it's at the level of pick your favorite dichotomy. The problem, of course, is that if the poet is crossing through that material, the emotions that it might evoke are far more general. Um, if you look, compare it to Wallace Stevens, in autumn, it actually should be in autumn air, grapes that make sharp air sharper by their smell, I believe you will immediately feel that you have to take the image in through your nose. Um, I have written 10 pages on these particular two lines, and I won't go into them at length because I'd rather get to the haiku. But that smell, that distinction between sharp and sharper air requires you summoning up in the memory that's right behind your nose of what autumn air's crispness is like, sharp, which you can do, and which requires the sense memory that your olfactory apparatus has in place, and then it requires you introducing the acrid, sweet grape smell into that, which you can do. It's work you can do. You don't think it, you do it. And this is one of the beginnings of the distinctions that I'm trying to make. And you have to put that acrid smell of the grape in there to make this, to, to do the reading of this line, to get the sharper smell that the introduction of the sweet yet acrid um, end of autumn grape smell will introduce into that original sharp air and card it from the sharper air um, so that many other things occur as a result of this. And I would like to call those resonances or overtones. First of all, once you begin to feel the sort of broad, white, undifferentiated, open autumn air, the, it's as if, you know, it, it's a different f-stop once the leaves drop, the autumn air. Okay? It's a brighter clarity. In that clarity, you're made to feel, because you see it suddenly with your eyes, the autumn air, as you're smelling it with your nose, the clarity seems to be synesthetically both olfactory and visual. The reason it's visual suddenly is because you've been asked to smell a grape, which you also see. And when you see the grape, most people, when I ask them, they imagine, it's very rare that someone imagines a green grape. For some reason, people tend to almost immediately imagine that sort of dark burgundy uh, autumn grape with a little bit of that white frosty coloration to it. 
but certainly they see a round thing. And they see a round thing with a skin and flesh inside it introduced into an undifferenti undifferentiated open space. Now, the reason that I can do this work is because my body has been asked to come into the reading process. I could spend an hour trying to make green leaves and dry leaves do this, and I would have to make it up. But I don't have to make anything up here. I can continue leaning on this. Because there's a difference between air, which is undifferentiated and open and without a border, and autumn, which is a time in the air, a particular quality given to the air, but also a temporal zone that seems to be delimited because it's one quarter of the year in the way that air is not. So I have this fantastic activity going on how if I pay attention to my reading and I slow not down enough that says that air contains autumn in a particular way and autumn is inflecting air in a particular way. But these are two large zones, one of which is bordered autumn, one of which is unbordered air, and into which I introduce an absolutely outlined and bordered grape. Now, the smells are guiding my eye, and the eye is guiding my sense of smell. So that once I get this idea of a, sh a sharper air, I also have a sense, you might have it, you might not, that the sharp air is somehow below, and the sharper air is somehow above. I don't know why that happens, but it tends to happen here. Certainly, they are not just one inside the other. One seems to be at a higher pitch than the other. Sharper indicates that through the nose that we've gone through one kind of clarity, a sweet, acrid thing that cards it and, in, and allows a higher kind of clarity to be suddenly inhaled. Now, autumn is going to be always in our poetry, an, a season that seems to make a human being feel that their mortality is something which is slightly awakened. Even children, in the process of the ways in which the earth seems to lose its leaves and go into winter, even though they're not at the autumn of their life, feel in autumn a kind of instinctive mammalian um, turn away from fullness towards a kind of emptying out and dormancy which the winter involves. In the human soul, there's always a sense of, of fear that attaches a little bit to the sensation of what is in winter. It's so empty. Will there be anything there? Certainly, in a secular sensibility like Stevens, it's always very interesting to see how he negotiates this idea of the sharper air that the grape introduces. One of the overtones here, and this is where the deep reading that I'm suggesting, in which you see the single, fleshy, vulnerable grape, because after all, a grape has a skin and flesh inside it. So it's the emissary, not only of the human eye, into the image here, which is an undifferentiated, large, bright, white, crisp, olfactory, visual field, but it's also the only thing that's sort of like us. It has an inside and an outside. It has a surface. It's kind of fleshy. But slowly, as you lean on this image, one of its overtones is the reminder that the grape comes into the harvest, um, see, comes, approaches us with the possibility of the harvesting of itself. And the harvesting of itself has given rise to uh, rituals involved with the grape over uh, millennia that are deeply committed to helping us make the transition from one kind of sharpness to another kind of sharpness in something that we would call the autumn of our life or the autumn of our years. So that this idea that the grape might give rise to subsequent notions of interpretation here, such as if you were writing this poem and going through this image, the idea that um, something bounded in something boundless might be the transition point from a sense of the sharp pains of human existence to the sharper unknown pains of a post-human existence, or whatever you wish to think the sky might hold in the sharper, is one of the possible ways in which the interpretability of this image begins to resonate off of it. But it does so because the poet has stood in a place in autumn, noticed this, reported it with his body, and allowed us enough information in the reading to do this work so that if the poet wants to go in that direction, when we arrive at sensations that involve whether there is something after this life or not, whether there is a communal 
or a non-communal way in which we, the eye can apprehend the world, or whatever direction we want to go in with this image, we can go through this image and get to a place that's legitimately true and shareable, because we can share the physical, physiological, really, experience, because we can read it with our senses. The same way if you look at the two little translations of the haiku that are just, that follow, that have number two and three, um, there's so much more to be said about that image um, that it's sort of unfair to go by it, but I'm going to go by a lot of things very quickly here. Um, this is just a description of cold. We all know what cold is. It's one of the fantastic things about the body. We have a community when we use our bodies, and poetry can transmit to, uh, from the poet to the reader almost, it, almost in its entirety an experience had, because no matter how culturally conditioned we might think our experiences are, salt tastes like salt to mammals. It might taste slightly differently in a place where salt is extraordinarily rare and prized as opposed to where salt is common. But the chances are the body tastes sugar and salt in ways that are more like than not. Whereas the body thinks of the idea of justice or um, taxes, uh, in radically different ways according to whatever system the body brings to that idea. So the, the, the function of the kind of reading I'm talking about is to allow ideas, like the way, in the way that the sacred was emerging out of that idea in the built into somewhere, resonating off of that Stevens line, to uh, allow ideas to emerge from a place where we are in concert with our bodies so that we can, if we arrive at ideas, not go, oh, how interesting the poet thinks that. I can interpret and understand what the poet thinks, but rather we might feel, oh, how amazing I have now felt this and thought this. And that level of thinking does not require interpretation. It requires perhaps a kind of undertaking and assent and willingness to read. Now, the cold in the next line, cold is something like salt or sugar. We all feel cold. Degrees of cold maybe feel different to people who haven't lived in cold climates. I have a student at present who's never been anywhere except for Florida before, and he's about to be in Massachusetts this winter, and he has no idea. So I think cold is interesting to me. I'm going to ask him to write about the cold. I think he might have some genuinely strange edge-like perceptions on it. But on the other hand, cold is cold. Deep winter, an oar strikes the water. Deep winter, oars strike the water. I've never once, actually, had somebody tell me that the plural was colder than the singular. There's a way in which deep winter and or strikes the water is colder than deep winter oars strike the water. Even if the oars are almost in tandem, there's something about the dispersal of the one sound into many that is to our bodies slightly less cold because dispersed, because not piercing and unique than the single oar striking the water. There are many other things that we do with this image and we could spend a great deal of time trying to figure out, for example, why the singularity of the oar seems to be more piercing than the multiplicity and why one of these constitutes a poem and the other one doesn't. One of them resonates and goes places. The other one has a much more difficult time doing so. The single oar striking the water, whether you want it to go in this way or that way, making its singular sound, breaking the silence that surrounds it, suggests the penetrability and simultaneous impenetrability of the water. It suggests the singularity of the boat, the bark on which we place a human being finally that is using that oar and the singularity of the way in which that oar goes down into the water ultimately will resonate into all sorts of feelings involving uh, the journey that the cold um, takes one on. If we look at two other poems here, um, I'd like to look at what I have numbered uh, 11 and then 10. Um, this, these two ones are going to be now attempts to read the sense data again 
When we get to the Mandelstam, we will be discussing the order of the sense data as opposed to the nature of the sense data. Um, I'd like you, when I read number 11, to try to feel which sense you're being asked to use to read each of the images. The bright autumn moon crying in the saucepan, the pond snails. What part of your body is registering the bright autumn moon? What are you receiving it with? You can feel yourself immediately go to the idea of it. You know, it's the bright autumn moon. But if you slow down a second, you have to feel that it's your eyes, your eye, that the bright autumn moon is coming in through. Its brightness is something that it takes, the bowl of the imagination has to employ the eye to feel the brightness. You don't feel it necessarily automatically on your hands. You feel it first in the eye, bright. Uh, there are three circles here, obviously, the moon, the saucepan, and the pond. And in these descending circles, we, we have to attend to what we're being asked to do as readers. We see the bright autumn moon. We see it up there, and we understand that it's on one of the circles besides the moon's own circle is the cycle that the moon is on, which is one kind of temporality. Once we get to the saucepan, we hear a crying, sometimes it's translated as hissing, crying in the saucepan is the sound of the cooking pond snails. You're using your ear to get that image, crying in the saucepan. But one of the things that happens in reading this is that you're very aware of the fact that you've used your eye, it's been asked to be operative, so that of course when you look down to the saucepan, you also see the circle of the saucepan. You're using your eye still since you've received the eye information from the brightness of the moon. And when you look down at the saucepan, it makes you very much feel that it's a full moon because you've got a circle that you're looking at. But when you listen to the crying, it's inflected by the brightness of the moon. And you have these two kinds of brightnesses, a visual and an auditory brightness, a kind of hissing, crying, fast heat on which you cook in the saucepan, the pond snails, and then the kind of brightness of the moon. And the idea that you would try to look at the saucepan and see the sizzling, and that you would try to hear the moon is a very interesting activity that gets frustrated precisely because you sense that those particular bodies, um, those sensations have been awakened and those senses have been asked to come into play. When you look to the third part of your image, down into the pond, the third circle, and you imagine, as you're asked to, the pond snails, you remember that the pond snails are in the water, and they don't grow on the surface of the water. They grow underneath the water. They grow actually at the bottom, along the edges of the pond. And so that what sense can you now receive that data through, since you've been actively asked to engage in looking and then hearing? Well, the third place that you're looking into is a pond in which you can't see the pond snails. So the, the third sense that you're asked to use is your, you suddenly realize it, imagination. You're now asked, you have seen the moon, you have seen the pan, you have heard the sound, you have seen and heard a sound of, uh, connection. You look down, the pond is mute. Inside it, where they live, are the pond snails that don't happen to be the ones in the pan where pond snails live, and you suddenly realize that you're looking down into a place with another sense called imagination, because it's not actually given to you to see. You have to cross through something invisible. You're not putting your hand in, you're putting your mind eye in to a mute place where the pond snails grow. Now there are three cycles of life present for you in this poem that you begin to feel the temporality of. The sequence in which the moon 
travels, which is a kind of eternal time, outside of human time, larger and longer than human time, at the same time as it's a cycle and it's recurrent. The saucepan is cooking something for a human being who is on a different temporal wheel and eating itself, nourishing, the, taking the pond snails into the body, is itself another cycle that we're meant to feel and imagine the coexistence of. And as we get down to the pond snails, at the bottom of the pond, inside the pond, the life of those pond snails in the temporal framework that we're given, a human life that eats and cooks, the moon's sempiternality that is outside, there is this third kind of time that pond snails live in, and the life of a pond. The life of a pond is probably less long than the life of a moon, but it's longer than the life of a human being. And the pond snails, which die each year and are reborn each year, have the kind of eternal recurrence that something like Keats's notion of the nightingale has, so that you have four or five different kinds of temporality that you're being asked to feel physically in this particular poem. And the most beautiful final detail about it is if you start with looking up at the moon, at the large sky with the moon in it and the cycle, the eternal large cycle that the moon is on, and you come down through the kitchen where the pond, where the human life is, and you go down to the bottom of the pond where the snails are, you have something which is itself shaped very much like a pond snail, which is this lovely cycling down in this um, shape. And that sort of sense of the different registers of human existence that you move back and forth on in this poem really can only happen if you haven't thought necessarily. Um, and you know, from the beginning, I would say I'm not trying to represent these haiku as they would be represented by the people who wrote them or in the tradition in which they were written. I'm trying to use them for us to figure out what we do in reading. And uh, I'm not trying to be faithful to the um, tradition of the haiku. I couldn't be in a translation anyway. What I'm looking for is what it is that makes this an operating imaginative situation and what it compels me to do with my body. When I look at the um, second one to the left of it, the full moon, a manservant leaving a puppy to die. I again have to start out with my body to read this poem, the full moon, and I have to see it up there, the big round full moon. I see the manservant leaving the puppy to die. How many of you see the puppy as light colored? Light colored puppy. Very hard to see this as a black puppy. It's, it has to do with the brightness of the moon. What we see is the manservant having been told to leave the puppy to die. The manservant is in his servitude. As he bends down, what do you see on his shoulders? You see the moonlight coming down on his shoulders. He's leaving. He has to be, he hasn't left the puppy to die. He's not walking away from it. The poem isn't situated at that point. It's situated at the point where the moon is above, the man is leaving the puppy in some place to die, and the puppy is at the final end of the chain. There are three kinds of temporality, again, present here. The full moon's temporality, the way in which it freely falls on the man who is not free. It lands on his shoulders. It lands on the back of his body. It lands somewhere in his body as he's outside leaving the puppy to die. That moon l lays itself over him because temporality lays itself over him. Servitude also lays itself over him. An order which he might not like lays itself over him. He is bending down under two temporal um, indentitures. One is time itself in the guise of the moon shining on his shoulders, weighing apparently nothing, although his life depends on it because it's in his mortality that that moon is communicating to him. At the same time, the order he's been given, 
and his status in life, a servant, um, is the temporal condition in which he's living. The puppy is yet another kind of existence, not the eternal orders of the moon, not the cycle of the human being in a certain measure of humanity connected to regular mortality and a certain aspect of his humanity con connected to his servitude. The puppy is the final order of reality represented in this poem, and the puppy is being left to die. The puppy is small. It's on a different time uh, cycle yet. It's going to live the least long of the three, the man, the moon, and the puppy. But what we're left with, because we're reading with our sense of duration, oh, the duration of the moon, oh, the duration of the man's life as a servant. And then we're left with this feeling of, how is the puppy going to die instantly? Is the puppy being drowned? No, the puppy is being left to die. So there's an amount of time that this poem is now making us feel with our bodies, which is how long it will take for the puppy exposed to eventually die. And the amount of life that that puppy has in it, the amount of life that the servant has in him, duration, the amount of life that the moon has in it before it goes out, are in relation to each other in this descending order of enchaining obligations, causes, and effects. All of them laved by this light, which is both itself a reflected light. So it's as if there was another order altogether, the sun in this case, making the moon light that leans on a man's shoulder, that compels him in his mortality to undertake his orders, that leans itself on the puppy, that makes the whiteness of the puppy visible at the bottom of the chain and allows the puppy to make us feel this incredibly acute not knowing regarding the exact temporality of what's left of the puppy's existence. Not that we privilege the puppy over the man or over the moon. It's just that the leaving to die activity makes us feel that there is not only time, duration, even something that we would have to think as a suffering in there, but there is a certain amount of time and then no more. And the dwindling of that is beautifully captured if we undergo the poem in this act of reading. We can then interpret it in many different ways. I'm going to give you an example before we move on to the um, I'm going to, the, the, at the number 17 at the bottom, I'm going to give you some examples of what I mean by interpretation when we come to these poems. As for the hibiscus by the side of the road, my horse ate it. Now, one of the things that you do in reading this poem is um, you make a hibiscus first. You have to make the hibiscus. Again, it's not, your conceptual intellect can't think um, what I'm going to read you some of the interpreters have thought. You make a hibiscus. It's about so tall, a hibiscus. How big is a hibiscus flower? It's big. It's like a dinner plate. Whether it's white or red, and there are disagreements about this, it doesn't really matter, it's about this big. It's a big thing, a hibiscus. It's fabulous. It's wrinkled. It grows in one day. It's you imagine a man on a horse. You imagine the road. We're all on the road. The horse is on the road. The man is on the road. The hibiscus is by the side of the road. You take the hibiscus, and you make it in the bowl of your imagination. It's there. What do you do next? You see the side of the road. You see the road. The horse eats the hibiscus. The hibiscus is now gone. It's inside the horse. You have the right to limit your imagination at this point as to what you will do with it. How you see it inside the horse is an interesting matter. Do you have to see it crumpled up and eaten? Do you suddenly see the hibiscus again big? How do you see it inside the horse? That's one of the problems of this poem. Where does the hibiscus go? The horse goes down the road. The hibiscus travels down the road with the horse. The man who is the poet is now traveling with the hibiscus in his mind, as the hibiscus is in your mind, and the hibiscus inside his horse. 
This is a very complicated set of transactions that you're being asked to feel because no matter how you read this poem, you see the hibiscus again outside. Then you see it inside the horse. You see the hibiscus in its singularity growing by the side of the road. To be by the side of the road is to be on one journey. To be on the road is to be another journey. The hibiscus has been taken from one status in nature by the side of the road and put inside the horse and traveling down to another journey. The hibiscus is going with the man. The hibiscus is going with the man who wrote the poem. The hibiscus is inside the horse and inside the mind of the man. He's inside our mind, the hibiscus is, in a couple of different ways. The hibiscus is inside our mind as outside the horse and as inside the horse. So we have both of those to deal with in the journey that we call traveling down the road. We have a side of the road sensation and an on-the-road sensation, and we have to have them both at once. That in and of itself is an extraordinary feeling for the way taking anything inside one is experienced. Once you have imagined the hibiscus and done something to it, you too have eaten it. You have somehow taken it inside you. The horse takes it inside him. You have to put it inside your head, hibiscus, and then inside the horse. You have to t then move them down the road. All of this activity is happening inside you. This, this series of recessed in insidenesses. There's the inside of the vision of the road and the hibiscus that you create. You take that flower and you put it in the image of the road. You put it inside the horse. You put the whole thing in your head, you move them down the road. This is what some interpreters say about this, though. Um, this haiku is a warning against forwardness. A rose mallow or a hibiscus will not be eaten by a horse if it is not blooming on the roadside. It is eaten by the horse because it grows too near the road. This is a warning against forwardness. Or, a rose mallow withers in one day and is therefore a symbol of life's transitoriness. Sadly, Basho's hibiscus was devoured by a horse before it even had time to attain that short-lived glory. Human life is like that. Now, these things bypass all the activity that I'm trying to talk to you about. The um, not undertaking the poem at all goes, the poet sketched a happening during his journey. Just as he saw it, I think it is an interesting depiction of a scene in a country lane. Or, surely what we have here is an example of the law of nature that governs the strong and the weak, the law by which one part of nature is, transformed to, is transferred to another part. Animistic sense, etc. didactic poem. Um, Another interpretation of it is life's ephemerality in her, that Basho inherits from medieval hermits. Or, this is a really wonderful one. Basho saw this, uh, which is rich, the, the, the hibiscus is rich in classical elegant beauty and it is devoured by a pack horse. Now, you know, these are astonishing interpretations and judgments. We, we make the horse bad. We make the hibiscus elegant and beautiful. We say the poem is a conflict between those two worldviews. Or we say it grows in one day. The horse lives a long time. We make the conflict between those. We can arrive at those things. We've actually arrived at a great many things by trawling through this poem. But the idea of having to put the hibiscus inside one's head and then put it inside the horse and have it be in the dark of one's own imagination where it is bright, and inside the body of the horse where it is also somehow bright, and to have it move when it didn't move before. These things are incredibly valuable undertakings, off of which resonant interpretations can come. Um, maybe not quite the ones that we have here. Um, lastly, perhaps, or next to last, because I'll end on the Dickinson poem. I'd like you to just look at 14 and 15. And we're going, there are two um, different translations years apart by the same translator of a poem of Mandelstam's. And um, I would like to point, argue that 14 is not a poem and 15 is a poem. Um, 
I'm going to do the work of 15 for you, and then we'll try to do the work of 14. Suddenly, from the dimly lit hall, you slipped out in a light shawl. The servants slept on. We disturbed no one. If I look at the other poem, suddenly in a light shawl you slipped out of the half-darkened hall. We disturbed no one. We did not wake the sleeping servants. Let's look at the work we have to do in 15. Suddenly interrupts the silence that precedes the poem. We will be more aware of that suddenly and its implications in this poem once we've gone through it. And it will have an amount of meaning that it can't have in 14. From the dimly lit hall, can you make a dimly lit hall in your heads? Make a dimly lit hall. Make a hallway. It recedes back. It's dimly lit. You have now a location in which something can be put in your head. Suddenly, in a light shawl, is not something you can quite do. You, you get suddenly in a light shawl, and you go, OK, suddenly, I don't know where to put suddenly. Um, I'll postpone that. In a light shawl, is it light in color or light in texture? I don't know. I'll have to postpone it. I'm just going to like have the content, light shawl. I don't know where to put it. Are we in a field? Are we in a house? I don't know where to put the shawl. I don't know whom to put it. I don't know what to do with the shawl. But suddenly, from the dimly lit hall, I can do, and this is the difference between imagery that you just read and imagery that you can do. Um, the reason you can do the dimly lit hall is not only that it's visual and it recedes and you can see it and it tells you what kind of light to put in it, but from is already vectoring something in your direction that makes the suddenly begin to feel like the break in the continuum of time that precedes this poem that it is. That's only the beginning of what's going to happen to suddenly. Suddenly breaks the poem and the dimly lit hall appears. You slipped out. I can put the you in the hall and slip them out from it. I can do that. In a light shawl. Amazing how the light color of the shawl is immediately apparent to me. Because even if it's light in texture, it's definitely light in color because of the gray, dim darkness of the hall out of which that shawl is emerging. And I can make that shawl emerge with all its bright, fringed suddenliness because the word suddenly was there, because a dimly lit hall was there, and because of the order of the sense data, the slipping out in a light shawl makes me feel the passage from the from back there to the here that the, the you is slipping out into strangely parallel to a number of things that are about to suddenly happen in the poem. The servants slept on. You suddenly feel, because you've had this enormous, this is a whole poem, the dimly lit hall out of which a, a you slips in a shawl suddenly. You've had a temporal hallway created for you, not just a physical hallway, because the suddenly is the breaking out from a continuum of a temporal hallway. And we have an incredible synesthetic sense of that bright shawl being like a suddenly. It's a visual suddenly in the dim hall, the light shawl, in the way that suddenly is a sudden conflagration on the continuum of unspoken time that precedes the poem. The temporal preceding ongoing um, corridor is broken into by the word suddenly, figured into a corridor out of which slips the light shawl. The other corridor that immediately comes to mind here in this next line is the sleep. The servants are in their sleep. They sleep on. They're in their sleep. The long container of their sleep that they are in is one kind of a hallway they are at present not slipping out of. There is no suddenly in their sleep, and there's no slipping out from it. They are in their sleep. Until they wake up, they are in that corridor. 
and they are in their servitude. And they are, it's Russia, they're not slipping out of that particular corridor at all. So suddenly, the ratio of the dimly lit corridor that they're in to the sleep that they're in, from which they can awaken, the servitude from which they cannot awaken without a revolution, um, are put into relationship with each other precisely because in the bowl of our imagination we had this fantastic from there to here dimly lit corridor out of which can emerge a you in a bright shawl with a fringe accompanied by the sense that a suddenly can interrupt the continuum of time as the speaking voice of a poet can interrupt the ongoing continuum. The, the history that the servants are in is a corridor they cannot escape from and their sleep is strangely, however dimly lit or however corridor-like, the only successive escape they might have from the other corridor that they're in. But there is no stepping out for them. And then we finally have the last action of mind in this poem, we disturbed no one. And you have, because of the preceding reading that you've been doing, you, can, you are now prepared for the sense of the no oneness or everyoneness or the continuum of all the people or no the people, you know, the everyone or the no one, the community, and the separation of the we, the two lovers, from the no one or the everyone. And the hallway, the long hallway of the no ones, which actually also means, doesn't mean that there's nobody there, it means we away, we disturbed no one, the no ones are actually people who could have been disturbed, therefore they are an everyone as well. And the long corridor of the anonymity of that no one is stepped out of by the very sensation of we, which has the conflagration-like, shawl-like, fringe-like uniqueness. And these people are free to step out of the corridor of anonymity and no oneness and let them sleep on while the servants cannot step out of it, most of the others in the culture cannot step out of it, and the poem allows the poet to step out of, with the conflagration of the poem, the long corridor of the unsaid and the undifferentiated and the unsingular into the uniqueness of the subjective rendered experience of a unique moment in time which has all these qualities that attach to history, um, status of different levels of freedom, all of them built on this single physical image. Now, if you look at the other poem, suddenly in a light shawl, there is nothing to do with the light shawl. You slipped out. You, you, suddenly in a light shawl, I have to float the light shawl. You, I don't know who the you is, but I put the shawl on some you somewhere, slipped out. I still don't know out from what of the half-darkened hall. By the time I get the half-darkened hall, what I do is I take a shawl, I put it on a person, I take the person, I put them in a hall. Nobody, in fact, has slipped out of the hall. I have had to, as a reader, put them back into the hall, which means the whole sensation of coming from there, the unspoken, to here, the spoken, because on this side, once they disturb no one, the lovers leave, and the hallway of the poem that has been created has been traversed the throat of the, of the open hallway of the throat of the poet has been opened and it has uttered its traverse and it's closed and they escape and the sleeping goes on and the servitude goes on. There is nothing that I can do of that nature with the other poem even though the content is the same. So that I go put the person back in the hallway, I put a shawl on them, I stand them in there and I think, now what? We disturb no one. I have no ready-made physiological sense situation into which to put the we and the no one. So it's just a piece of information. It just says, you know, we didn't wake anybody up. We were very quiet. We did not wake the sleeping servants. The we's relationship, which is so unique in the placement of the poem, in this piece that just is a narrative and not a poem, is simply a piece of information. We did not wake the sleeping servants. We don't have that fantastic structure, um, scaffolding, image of the dark hallway and the suddenly from you slip out, which is the whole vectoring that allows us to feel the temporality of love, 
of utterance, of history, of revolution, and of the impossibility of traversing it if you're indentured and unfree. Um, if you look on the other side of this piece of paper, there's an amazing poem by Li Po that I'd like to just quickly go through because it's again an autumn poem. All of these poems have been about what we do in seasons when we have to wear shawls and protection and look at moons and put out puppies to die. And all of this is the season that we're in. This is very close to the season that we're in where the first frost might be upon us. So bright a gleam on the foot of my bed. Could there have been a frost already? Lifting myself to look, I found that it was moonlight. Sinking back again, I thought suddenly of home. Now, it's very interesting um, transition from the haiku in terms of just genre to the Chinese poem, which introduces a first person, a sentence, um, a sense of action of a certain kind, which is of a different di nature. And I'm not going to go into that now, but um, it's extraordinarily interesting. What is important here for us to recognize before we look quickly at the other translation is what sense, what part of our body we are asked to undertake each line in this poem with. So bright a gleam on the foot of my bed is a perception. The haiku of this would have been, so bright a gleam on the foot of my bed I think suddenly of home, right? Now, there's, this involves a different set of actions. So bright a gleam on the foot of my bed, I have to do with my eyes and my looking and my sense of perception. It is a sense image. I, I see, just as the suddenly in the last poem was present, this so brightness is the first thing I see. And I see a gleam. I'm allowed to lay it out along the bed, and I'm allowed to put it on the foot of the bed. And I feel this gleaming that I look down at. Then I think, could there have been a frost already? Now, this is a speculative thought on the part of the person who just reported a sense perception. The mind comes into this particular action, and the poet goes, what is that stuff down there shining? Is it frost? He's just awakened, so bright. You suddenly realize it's like the suddenly. He's awakened. Wakefulness is going to be very important here, the sudden wakefulness. And he, what is he trying to do with the, the typical signature thing we do with the mind, discern difference? Is it frost? Is it moonlight? It tells you that it's cold where he is, because it could be frost on the foot of his bed. It is important that we don't know and probably should know whether it would be wood or cloth or unlikely metal or whatever at the foot of the bed, because the quality of the gleam is affected by that. And there's probably a little bit of frustration in your sense apparatus, because you just don't know quite what kind of a gleam to make at the foot of the bed. But you're probably putting it on the cloth, I imagine, putting it on the cloth rather than on the wood, so that it would be the way bright light strikes that cloth in moonlight. Nobody has to tell you that it's moonlight. Could there have been a frost already? Is the mind coming in to go, what is that stuff down there? That's a second waking. The first waking is, I wake to see. The second waking is, I wake to then see and discern and know. Now the divided self is present. We see, and then we question what it is that we're seeing. We want to know what it is. That, in that doubleness is what allows this poem to occur in the extraordinary next line, which is basically a transfer of a moment of consciousness from what you would call the yugen consciousness of the haiku to what is sudden, something much closer to Western consciousness. Lifting myself to look, I find that it is. Okay. The divide itself is built into that fantastic phrase. It doesn't say, I sit up. I have to lift myself. If I have the agency to lift myself, I am, in effect, two. I'm the feeler thinker. 
I'm lifting myself. I have a body that my will lifts. I have a musculature that my soul's desire lifts. Do you see what I'm talking about? It's a doubling in that phrase. Lifting myself to look. And once the two parts, sense and mind, have awakened and each done their piece of work, I observe, I ask the question. I feel it, I feel it, I feel, look, see it, I ask what it is. I lift the two parts of myself and I look and the glance reunifies me and I find that it is moonlight. There's something extraordinarily poignant and sad in that divided, dissociated sensibility reunifying itself in the act of defining knowledge, finding out what that thing called gleam down there is. It is moonlight. There is something reifying and gratifying about knowing what that gleam is, and there's a terrible loss in it as well, which this poet feels. Knowing that it's not a gleam, it is actually one thing or another, and in this case, it is moonlight. There is something cold about that knowledge, and we know it because he has sat up in a place where there could be frost. Therefore, as the bed covers come slightly off of him sitting up, He's up in the cold, and he looks down, and there's some coldness to knowledge that doesn't allow for the endless possibilities of what all gleams could be, and it narrows it down to the single gleam, which is the name of the thing. I've identified it, it's moonlight. What's extre extremely moving is that's accompanied by a physical coldness. Sinking back down, I thought suddenly of home. Now, just Two things happen here. Just the rising and sinking associates the, man, the man's mind seeing, wanting to know, having known, sinking back down with the cycle that the moon itself is on. They're two different cycles, but they're both a rising and a sinking. So there's a part of this that's seen as the natural condition of being unified in sleep, awaking into sense and then thought, dividing, reunifying in glance and in knowledge and sinking back down into a condition which now knows of the gap that was there. It knows of the gap because it has reunified the parts of the gap in this very impoverished thing, which is knowledge. This is moonlight. It's not all possible gleams. And it's that gap that makes him feel of the, the larger gap, which is that he is away from whatever you would call home. He is at a gapped distance from it. Now, any sinking back down, you know, there's one home that we're born out of and only one home that we go back to. So, you know, however much he might be going home for a visit, metaphorically and in the sensation of things, the only final resting place that you sink back down to is death. It's the only home you go back to. It's actually in you know, every idea of a return, including Ulysses to Ithaca, the idea of nostos, of, of, the, of the return, um, is always attached to some sensation of, of death. It's the only final resting home you have. So to think that you are here at a certain distance from there is what that sinking back down gives you. It also, though, gives you simultaneously the warmth of sinking back down into the bed and into a sleep which is now quite altered by the suddenliness of this interruption. Now, if we look at the other translation, this is Witter Binner's, this is Merwin's now we're going to be looking at. The entire problem of what the I is, the first person comes in so brilliantly in the I found. It's the I that finds it not just the thing in your head, which is in fact the glance that finds it, but it's the thing behind your head, the first person, the mind. I find that it was moonlight. You can't even find moonlight. You can only find out that it is moonlight. The gap between you and moonlight, you can't even touch it. You can't get to it. The moon is itself, again, a reflected creature, and this person has reflected upon the reflection of the gap from things that he is in that distance from home, which would be unity with moonlight, which one cannot have. In this other translation, I wake and my bed is gleaming with moonlight, the entire problem of what am I looking at? What is it? First I feel it, then I look, then the looking leads me to think, and then I think, see, know it. And that incredible acquiring and losing at the same time is completely gone. 
I wake, and it's appropriate, therefore, that the poet puts the I right there. The first person is already present. The first person is not created by the act of waking and noticing. The first person is already there. Might as well put it at the front of the sentence. I wake, and my bed is gleaming with moonlight. End of poem. End of problem. End of predicament. Interesting that the actual frost in the other poem, which is an actual cold, which turns metaphorical so that we can lead in interpretation to, you know, because it's cold and he thinks it could be frost, the sensation of knowing has a kind of coldness attached to it, which is an interpretive resonant extension off of the actual cold. Here, the cold is already made figurative and metaphorical. He's not actually frozen solid. It's a figure of speech already. Frozen into the dazzling whiteness, I look up. It's interesting that never in Witterbinner's translation does he even have to say that anything is white. And dazzling is the key term that tells us that this is a complete point of view shift and a completely subjective poem. Because the moon itself is not dazzling. You, it, it is only be-dazzling. Dazzling is the effect that something has on a viewer. And the speaker is dazzled. There is no quality to moonlight which is inherently dazzling. You have, it has to be something, there has to be you know, an, an object that is dazzled for it to be dazzling. While bright attaches itself to moonlight whether someone is looking at it or not. Slight difference there in the quality of those terms. I look up to the moon herself and lie thinking of home. This poem is about a completely different subject. It has the same content. It might not be a poem, but if it is a poem, it has none of the divided self. The self is unified. The entire drama of the poem is of another order. It's probably along the lines of moonlight versus moon, the, refle you know, the reflected moonlight being identified to the moon herself. It has to proceed with something quite typical in Western poetry, which is a kind of exaggeration. Um, I look up to the moon herself. It needs to personify the moon. It needs to, it does all the signature things that we do when we go quickly past the sense data and immediately make it a mental situation. Um, it's a platonic situation in this poem, the problem of moonlight versus moon. And the lie thinking of home, I wouldn't know if you asked me if that was a sad or happy event at the end of the handwritten poem. I don't know if thinking of home feels good or bad. I don't know. I look at the moon herself and I'm thinking of home. Maybe home is like great, like a big bright moon. I don't know. In the other poem, the incredible complexity of the gap that's created between one part of the self and the other is completely cl clarifying as to what the idea of home is. But it has to do with undertaking the physical actions on the, it has to do with the poet undertaking the physical actions to look at, see, report in the right order of the sense data so that we can undertake them. And by undertaking them, arrive at all these interpretive strategies that I've um, driven you a little batty with. And I'm just going to read you, lastly, um, this Dickinson poem. And um, I'm not going to do as much work with this poem. This poem is about the very drama that I've been um, asking us to undertake in um, reading. It's about two kinds of experience. It's going to call them um, science and overtake and human nature and feel. And what this poem is going to do is undergo an experience with the body as long as it can. And then it's going to finally after living in the negatively capable condition that it asks us to live in, it's going to enact the irritable reaching after fact and feeling that it calls science. And, um, I'm, and it's going to overtake its subject. And I'm going to read it to you and just go over the very first stanza. For some reason, this edition doesn't break. Please draw a line after when March is scarcely here. Um, it's supposed to have a stanza break there. I've seen the original, so I know it's the case. It's a mistake here. Um, this Harvard edition is just a nightmare. OK. Um, a light exists in spring, not present on the year at any other period.
when March is scarcely here. A color stands abroad on a solitary field that science cannot overtake, but human nature feels. It waits upon the lawn. It shows the furthest tree upon the furthest slope you know. It almost speaks to you. Then, as horizon's step or noon's report away, without the formula of sound, it passes, and we stay. A quality of loss affecting our content as trade had suddenly encroached upon a sacrament. Now, just to point out quickly what the reading that we've been doing would lead us to do with the first stanza here, a light, let's go back to the Stevens line, is sort of a big spatial thing. Exists is in a duration of time that's very, very long. It's actually almost non-temporal. It almost just has to do with being. But existence is really long. In spring, spring is a shorter piece of time. Spring is one quarter of the year. So existence is bigger than spring. Not present on the year. The year is longer than the spring, right? For season, spring is shorter. Existence is longer than the year. At any other period, where do we put period? Period is probably about the size of spring, maybe a little smaller because it's a particular time of spring in which this light exists, so probably smaller. By now we have this fantastic accordion-like vertigo in which she's not only said in spring, but she said on the year. So you've had this temporal spatial vertigo where you have to go, a light exists in spring, and you make a contemporal continuum, not unlike that corridor we were looking at, not present on the year, and you suddenly feel like the year is a field of time that's, that, that this light can be on. So you have spatial temporal coordinates present for you at any other period, and you don't know in this incredible sense that you've been undergoing, not unlike what Bacho's been making you undergo with those haiku, of these, all these different kinds of durations of time. When March, and this thing called March, it's not unlike the naming and the sadness in that third line of the leaf, but what is a March? What have we done to time when we've taken a twelfth of this sliver called a year, which is much, much smaller than existence, but bigger than, and called it March. The very word is so fantastic in this case because it's very much our overtaking something that can't be named and calling it by a name. We're going to call this little sliver of the period smaller than spring, we're going to call it March. And then what she's going to do is say, is scarcely, so you have to back up to the end of February, Right? Because she's going to make sure that since you've been going forward, 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 and March is the term for that, you've been overtaking all forms of temporality, she's going to make you jog back to is scarcely, just so that you know that this thing runs backwards if you want it to. And then she's going to go here. And the dimensions of that word here, the absolute vertigo with which you finally place yourself in the here, is completely dependent on this elaborate structure that she's created. If you're willing to read slowly and undergo the difference between exist, spring, year, period, march, and here, and scarcely. All temporal markers jogging you back and forth, and then go do all the work of in and on and is. I mean, there's a ton more to do with this stanza. But this, the drama enacts itself and unfolds itself and pulls you into it. The color stands abroad on a solitary field that science cannot overtake. And she's saying, do not do that work of overtaking, trying to understand this thing. Stay here with me and feel the way I've asked you to undergo the first stanza. But human nature feels. So the distinction I've been trying to draw tonight is encoded in those two words and will enact itself as this poem finishes itself. It waits. It doesn't, ju doesn't just exist. Exist is revised by stands. The idea of the space-time problem is enlarged by a broad field. It waits upon, now you see a lawn. And then it has you show the, f it, it becomes more and more uh, filled with agency. It exists, it stands, it waits, it shows. Of course, 
it almost speaks to you, this light, this thing, this presence, absolute presence. It's not even light, it's the presence that this light has of having the capacity to make you feel your hereness because it has the capacity to make you have to undertake all the possible coordinates of hereness. And without going on at great length here, it shows the furthest tree upon the furthest slope. You lean out, you're looking. If by n at the end of this talk you don't know that you're using your eyes, I should probably be shot. But it, it's, it's, you're looking at this tree and you're seeing the furthest tree. And of course, the singularity of yourself and the singularity of the tree are completely felt in relation to each other. On the furthest slope, you know that knowledge that you have. And then as Horizon Step and Noon's report away, it's very interesting, it's the Civil War, there's going to be all sorts of sounds in here that have to do with the kind of falling back into history. Without the formula of sound, it passes and we stay. I can't go into this poem because we're running out of time, but what happens here is when it passes and we stay, what had been a poem completely dependent upon the senses, using descriptive language, falls from the unity it literally falls out of the garden of sense unity with its description. It passes and you stay behind. You are now in a fallen condition. What language do you speak in, in a fallen condition? The language of overtaking and the conceptual intellect. The language of generalization and abstraction and naming. I can now tell you from this distance, reader, that equality, that I'm going to call loss, affects my contentment, and I'm even going to make the broader piece of figuration here, as if trade had suddenly encroached upon a sacrament. And in fact, the sacrament of the unified sensibility that makes you read with a part of your body she's calling human nature, when you fall out of that garden, you're in the lap state of what we call thinking. And what we call thinking here is, of course, a profound action in its own right. It's what we can take from the poem as the generalized description of it. Loss, contentment, and a figure that enlarges the knowledge of the grief-ridden disappearance of presence, being left alone in absence, into the overtaking terminology of trade and sacrament. What this poem is beautiful for me in its undertaking is this enactment of these two kinds of language and two kinds of proceedings. It's as if the first line of the lipo were in everything but the last stanza, and the second line of the lipo were the last stanza here. And we do both, but there is a division, and what Dickinson is brilliant at in many of her poems is making you feel precisely how much you have to use one sense in order to get to the edge of it and let go and feel the fall into the other sense, the mind in this case, that you have to use. And it's all you have left to grapple um, with when absence and radical absence of this kind, and you're left behind in thought, overtaking, uh, fact, meaning, but also um, knowledge, which is, of course, why we're supposed to have been thrown out of the garden to begin with. Thank you. Wow.